Good afternoon. Uh, good afternoon and welcome to the Washington Institute. I'm Rob Satloff, the director of the Institute. I'm very happy to welcome all of you here today. Uh, just at the outset, if I can please remind you, uh, uh, cell phones um, off, please, not just on, um, on uh, vibrate, but off completely. Uh, this event is being live streamed uh, for our thousands of fans around the world. Um, this event is being broadcast by C-SPAN, so everything you say um, uh, can and will be used against you. Uh, so, but please do turn your cell phones off. Um, we're, we're gathered here today because President Obama is off for the inaugural overseas visit of his second term, and he is going to the Middle East. He's going to Israel, to the West Bank, and to Jordan. Um, his itinerary is uh, very different than the itinerary of his uh, Middle East trip um, in the beginning of his first term. We're going to hear more about that. And I think the mission of this trip is very different than the mission of that inaugural trip of his first term, and we're going to hear about that. Um, there is much to talk about because the Middle East agenda is deep and broad, and uh, despite all the um, the popular talk about uh, tilting to Asia, it's a region that will attract us whether or not we decide um, to focus on it. Um, and to help the administration uh, uh, navigate through the turbulent waters of the Middle East, uh, the Washington Institute um, is uh, publishing the last of its transition papers, uh, strategic reports prepared just for uh, the beginning of this new administration. Uh, when you depart, you can pick up the precy to our last strategic report titled Obama II and the Middle East, Strategic Objectives for U.S. Policy, jointly authored by um, two of the foremost thinkers about Middle East policy, and we're very proud that both of them are here at the Washington Institute, Ambassador Dennis Ross and Ambassador James Jeffrey. Um, Ambassador Ross, of course, we're about to hear from Dennis, um, served throughout um, um, most of the first term, uh, first in the State Department and then in the White House, uh, with responsibility for um, overseeing all the National Security Council work in the Middle East. Uh, and Ambassador Jeffrey, uh, Jim Jeffrey, uh, completed his uh, distinguished service in the uh, diplomatic corps um, last year, um, after having served in um, uh, as ambassador in Turkey and in Iraq, previously in an incarnation in Albania, and as the deputy national security advisor in the Bush administration, in which he played a special role in addressing the Iraq question. So we brought these two um, um, highly experienced strategic thinkers and policy practitioners together to produce a policy paper for the Obama administration, and we urge all of you to, uh, to pick up the, uh, the synopsis of that paper on the way out, and it will be available for you on the web um, uh, very shortly this week as uh, the President um, takes off for his trip abroad. And to discuss the, uh, the thinking behind the trip to the Middle East, uh, what Middle Easterners are expecting to hear from the President, what the implications of this trip might be, for the broad range of American interests in the Middle East. Uh, we have this panel, a uh, distinguished panel of Institute experts. Um, first, we're going to hear from, uh, from Ambassador Ross, from Dellett, from Dennis, um, who will provide uh, the, um, the context, the thinking behind, um, behind the visit, what the visit might, might accomplish, um, and how the visit may differ from uh, President Obama's first trip abroad. Um, in 2009. Uh, then we'll turn to David Mikovsky. David is just off the plane from, uh, from Israel, uh, where he met with uh, senior Israelis, senior Palestinians, um, uh, just as the new government was being formed in Israel. Um, uh, there is no truth to the rumor that David brokered the final, the final agreement um, that, that, that brought this new government into being. It is not true at all, and we deny it heartily. Um, but David brings uh, fresh insight uh, um, from his trip abroad. And then um, uh, our third speaker will be Mike Singh, our managing director and former senior director um, um, on the National Security Council and the Bush administration with responsibility for the Middle East. Uh, and Mike brings um, um, perspective not just from, uh, from his planning for President Bush's 
uh, trip to Israel, um, but also uh, an overall view um, about uh, where this, this visit fits in in addressing or perhaps not addressing key challenges on America's Middle East agenda. Uh, lots, of, uh, lots of important insight. I'm going to turn the podium directly over to Dennis. We'll hear from our three speakers, and then we'll open it up for your questions and your comments. Uh, thanks, Rob. I know you're all here because you want actually not to hear about the Middle East, but you want to hear about how I'm approaching bracketology these days with the NCAAs. <laughs> Anybody who would really like to know who's going to win, you'll have to ask me later. <laughs> what I thought I would do is uh, provide a kind of frame analytically uh, for this visit by the President to the region. Uh, and I, I think the way to do it is to start by saying the context for this trip is dramatically different from the context that shaped the President's first trip uh, to the Middle East in, uh, in June of 2009. At that time, I think that the, the mindset was based upon uh, giving a speech uh, shaped around a set of assumptions that really grew out of things that the President had said during the campaign. Uh, he, had, uh, he had announced that he was going to take a trip to the Middle East, he, or at least he had announced that he was going to give a speech in a Muslim-majority country. And I think what was guiding that was a, a set of perceptions that at least were believed to be held uh, in large parts of Muslim-majority countries. There was a perception, I think, that was wrong but nonetheless existed, that somehow the Bush administration had been engaged in a war in Islam. Uh, and there was a feeling if we didn't address that, that would be a continuing source of recruitment for terror against the United States. And it was important to reach out somehow to Muslim-majority countries. Uh, and this was going to shape uh, the purpose of the, the speech in Cairo in 2009 and the trip itself. I think there was a, another perception that, again, there was, a, there was a perceived need to address, which was that somehow the U.S. Uh, in the preceding uh, uh, terms of the Bush administration had been very much focused on trying to impose an order on the Middle East, had been preaching to the Middle East. Uh, and, the, and President Obama was going to go out and part of the outreach was going to be an outreach designed, again, to change the image that we, we were prepared to accept other approaches. We might have our own values, we would talk about our own values, but we understood this could not be a case of us hectoring or lecturing or preaching. Uh, and so again, part of an outreach towards Muslim-majority countries was, uh, was very much the impetus for what was going to be the trip. Uh, when you think about the Middle East four years ago, and you think about where we are right now, that Middle East, the President was going to Egypt and it was Mubarak's Egypt. Well, the, the Egypt of today, it's not clear whose Egypt it really is. The Muslim Brotherhood is in control, but they're facing what can only be described as a, enormous instabilities. Uh, and, and that, in many ways, is kind of a microcosm for what you're seeing across the region as a whole. If in 2009 uh, the President wasn't going there to sort of preach or dictate uh, what, the, what the future should be, though there should be a set of values that he did outline that he thought should be uh, that would continue to guide us, that there's a different reality today. The different reality today is that we have a Middle East that's in turmoil. We have a Middle East that's characterized by upheaval. We have a Middle East that's characterized by unknowns. Anybody who tells you today they know where it, what things are going to look like uh, in the Middle East uh, a year from now or a couple years from now is kidding themselves or kidding you. Uh, the fact of the matter is this is, a, this is a region that is undergoing a transformation, and we're in chapter one of that transformation, and maybe there's 20 chapters to be written. So the context in which the President goes out is dramatically different. Uh, and as Rob was saying, unlike in, in 2009, he's not going to a country that he went to then. Uh, he went to Saudi Arabia before he went to, to Cairo. In this case, he's going to, uh, he's going to be seeing the Israelis, the Palestinians, and the Jordanians. Uh, and the focus is clearly very different. Uh, and at least in part, uh, at least one major element of this trip is designed to reach out to the Israeli public. Now, again, there's an interesting irony here, because the effort to reach out in 2009 was perceived by Israelis as somehow coming at their expense. Again, that may not have been the intent, but that certainly was the perception within Israel. Uh, and it created an irony. It created an irony that the administration was about trying to reach out uh, to basically the rest of the Middle East, and it was going to come uh, at Israel's expense. And the irony is that 
This is an administration that ended up committing itself in a very dramatic, systematic way, in a very intense way, to focusing on the development of, of security cooperation with the Israelis, uh, an intense dialogue across the board on all national security kinds of questions, uh, a kind of collaboration uh, uh, with the Israelis on a whole range of intelligence, military, uh, and, and security questions. And so the irony is that on the one hand, there's a perception from the Israeli public that the administration is not particularly sensitive to Israeli needs. And on the other, there is a, a relationship, a dialogue, a level of cooperation that actually exceeds anything that's taken place before. And this trip in many ways is designed, I think, to sort of blend the reality of what the cooperation has been with the perceptions within Israel. And that leads me to sort of a, a broad second point. There will be a public dimension to the trip in Israel and a private dimension to the trip in Israel. And that's going to be true for uh, what the President does with the Palestinians, with Mahmoud Abbas. It's going to be true with what he does in Jordan as well. And let me say a couple of words about what I would, I think, the, both the public dimension and the private dimensions uh, of the trip are very much likely to be. Again, if part of the point of connecting with the Israeli public is what's guiding the, the logic of the trip, at least as it relates to Israel, then much of what the President's going to be doing, both in terms of what he visits and in terms of what he says, is going to be designed to reach out to the Israelis in a way that's, that is geared towards dealing with Israeli concerns, demonstrating the nature of the relationship, creating the kind of emotional connections, uh, highlighting the, the durability of the relationship, not only from the past but also in the future, reassuring the Israeli public that there's an understanding of the circumstances and the context that Israel now lives in, and all the uncertainties that, Israel, that Israelis now face. Uh, and, and the purpose, in no small part, uh, is to not just build the connection, but to demonstrate that uh, when the President says he has Israel's back, that then has a kind of credibility with the Israeli public. Now, that then creates a certain meaning, a certain consequence. When the President talks about his approach towards Iran, it's no longer going to be an abstraction for the Israeli Republic. They're going to have a feeling of, all right, the President's quite serious about that, and that creates some greater space uh, for the President pursuing what I think the policy that he wants to, uh, that he is continuing to pursue vis-a-vis -vis the Iranians. I would say it also is relevant as it comes to the Palestinians, because here again, I think what's, what is, is certainly, I think, part of the motivation is to create a context when the United States raises an issue or asks for something, the Israeli public can look at that in a context of saying, all right, the President's raising this because he sees this as somehow responding to an Israeli need. Uh, and so I think here again what you see is an effort to create space for some of the policies we're likely to pursue. Now that's the public dimension as it relates to Israel. What about the private dimension? I think the private dimension uh, is going to be a very serious set of discussions across the board on the issues that are of concern to both of us. And here again, I would sort of remind you, it's always useful to take a step back. With all the uh, concerns about what's the character of the relationship and how do the President and the Prime Minister get along, it's, I think it's highly useful to remember, when you look at Iran, our strategic objective and the Israeli strategic objective is the same. It's the prevention of an Iran with nuclear weapons. Uh, when you look at Syria, the strategic objective of the United States and the strategic objective of the Israelis, I would say, again, very much the same. Uh, I don't think either one of us wants to see uh, Syria disintegrate, collapse. Neither one of us wants to see chemical weapons uh, in the hands of jihadis. Certainly the last thing the Israelis want to see are jihadis on their border. Uh, the fact is the strategic objectives, the strategic concerns are very much the same uh, and are likely to, I think, lend themselves to discussions about uh, what do you do in the event of different sets of contingencies? Uh, when you look at the Arab awakening and what's going on in Egypt, the strategic concerns, the strategic objectives, again, very much the same. And I would even say on the Palestinians, there is a, a very similar strategic objective. Neither one of us wants to see the collapse of the Palestinian Authority. Uh, the collapse of the Palestinian Authority creates a void, and uh, anybody who thinks that it's going to be filled by, uh, by forces that are going to be particularly of interest to the Israelis or us, I think, is kidding themselves. So here again, you have, a, you have a, a very rich agenda for what should be a discussion between the two on these array of issues, taking account of what are the points of strategic convergence. Now, obviously, 
under the rubric of strategic convergence, there can be tactical differences. On the question of Iran, there's no doubt that there's going to be a very serious discussion between the President and the Prime Minister. There has been very high-level dialogues on an intensive basis that have been conducted with the most senior people around. Uh, the President and the Prime Minister, but there's no substitute for what they can do directly and, and how they will discuss this issue. And it's not new that each of us have, may have, as I said, a, a strategic orientation. The Israeli concern all along has been how much time is going to be devoted to diplomacy if the diplomacy isn't going to succeed? Uh, and is this diplomacy going to stretch beyond the point where Israel could lose its military option when it's dealing with what is an existential threat? Now, I don't anticipate in private that you're going to have a discussion that somehow the Prime Minister tries to pin down the President on, well, if diplomacy fails, when exactly are you going to act? And I think he's not going to have that kind of discussion because he's not really going to want to get a question from the President where the President wants to pin him down on what commitments he's prepared to make in a very specific sense. So I think what you're going to have is a conversation that focuses much more on where the Iranian program is and what's the meaning of prevention? When you have an objective of preventing Iran from having nuclear weapons, what's the point at which prevention could lose its meaning? And I can, I can envision a kind of conversation between the two that focuses on the full array of the Iranian nuclear capabilities. When the Prime Minister laid out his red line when he went to New York, he focused on one very narrow aspect of the Iranian nuclear program, and that was uh, the accumulation of medium-enriched uranium. And he identified one bomb's worth as being a red line. Well, it's rather interesting, I think, that the one thing that the Iranians have really slowed down on uh, is the accumulation uh, of their medium-enriched uranium. In fact, you see them oxidizing it so that, in fact, rather than accumulating more, uh, while they are accumulating, they're accumulating at a much slower pace. In an interesting way, it kind of signals that the Iranians do recognize certain thresholds that might trigger military action. And so there, they sort of have moved much more slowly. Now, they're not moving slowly in anything else. They continue uh, to enrich at a lower level, and now they're introducing the next generation of centrifuges. By the way, these are centrifuges that they've worked on for the last decade. And now, if they're actually able not simply to install them, but to have them operate, they increase by three to four times the efficiency uh, of their enrichment rates. So I can envision a discussion on, all right, <clears throat> the red line of medium rich uranium that the Prime Minister put out there is one measure, but it's a very incomplete measure. So what's the totality <laughs> of capabilities? How much enriched uranium? How many centrifuges, both of the IR1 type and of the next generation type? What combination of these gets you to the point where we could actually lose confidence in knowing that, in fact, we could prevent the Iranians before they could actually present a fait accompli to the world. I can envision that kind of a discussion. I can also envision on the Palestinians a discussion that says, all right, we both share the objective of ensuring that the Palestinian Authority doesn't collapse. What is it that you do to make that less likely? And given everything else that's going on in the region, uh, the one thing you don't want, given all the other uncertainties, is to have a void now in the West Bank as well. So what is it that should be done? I have no doubt that when the President says he's not going out there with a peace plan, I'm quite certain he's not going out there with a peace plan. But I suspect that he's going out there to sort of ask the Prime Minister, given this context, what do you think you can do? What do you think uh, makes sense to be doing in terms of an objective of ensuring the Palestinian Authority doesn't collapse and ensuring that, in fact, this is an issue that doesn't become worse for you and basically for us as well? So. That, I would say, is, is basically how I envision things going in Israel. Now, what about the, the public and private uh, dimensions on the rest of the trip? Well, I think with the Palestinians, the, the public dimension is to demonstrate that the President cares about it. I mean, there were all these stories that were being written about, well, you know, the President in the second term, you know, this is not an issue where he's going to put much emphasis. Rob was saying, right, you know, we saw all the, the focus on the pivot to Asia. Well, we have a pivot to Asia, and yet the very first trip that the President's taking is to the Middle East, which suggests that you can have a focus on Asia, but there's a recognition that when you don't pay attention to the Middle East, the Middle East has a way of imposing itself on you. Uh, and I think this trip, at least from the Palestinian standpoint, is at least a signal the President hasn't lost interest uh, in the issue of trying to promote peace, but there's a question of what's the best way to do it. I suspect 
when he reaches out in public to sort of emphasize the importance of trying to do something, uh, he will have a, a, a private conversation as well that I think with, uh, with Abu Mazen is very much geared towards saying, all right, what is it that can be done from your standpoint? Uh, and I think also he's bound to have a conversation with him that says, you know, if you want to continue to go down the, the UN road, if you want to continue to go down the route of, of moving on the international organizations, that's not a road that's going to lead anywhere. So let's focus on a road that, that has the potential to lead somewhere. You know, I, I didn't mention on the Israeli side, I said there was a convergence on Syria, but there'll certainly be a private discussion on Syria and Israel. There'll be a private discussion with Abu Mazen on Syria as well. You have 400,000 Palestinians uh, who are in Syria and who are in a very vulnerable position. And it's hard to imagine, even if that's not much of a public dimension for the conversation, it's hard to imagine that that's not going to be part of the private conversation. Sure, there'll be a focus on the peace issue, but there'll also be a focus on this. And what, if anything, we in the international community can be doing uh, to somehow safeguard uh, those Palestinians who are there. I would say with Jordan, you're also going to have a public and private dimension. First of all, just being there, it sends a signal of interest, which is, I think, important. But here, the private dimension, I think, has to focus as much as anything on Syria. You have 400,000 Syrian refugees in Jordan today, 100,000 additional since the beginning of this year. If the pace continues, you could have something like 700,000 by June. The impact on Jordan, its ability to absorb this, uh, is actually very hard to, to contemplate. Uh, and I think here again you're going to have, even if this trip wasn't going to be about Syria, the fact is every private meeting is going to end up having a pretty serious discussion about what next. Uh, and I think, by the way, that's not a bad thing, because it's pretty clear that the administration at this point, if you looked at Senator Kerry's trip, every day on that trip you saw him, in a sense, evolving in terms of what we might be doing on Syria. I suspect the administration is taking a, a hard look uh, at uh, and a fresh look at what can be done. And I suspect that this trip is going to very much add to that. Thank you, everyone. It's good to see everyone. And, um, it's good to be on the panel with my colleagues. I um, just came back yesterday. I must say, I, I'm, well, Dennis and I often have our own convergences. I might be a little less upbeat um, <laughs> having returned from there. And, it, you know, it could be a question of how these things are, are put forward. But I, um, I agree with him definitely on the public piece. I mean, I... I cannot see Obama but succeed on the public part of the trip, because it really is two trips in one, at least to Israel. The public part, it's an, uh, Israel, you'd be hard-pressed to find a Ford minivan's worth of Israelis who are anti-American. Uh, they want to like an American president. Whatever their differences have been with Obama, and they've been recorded in the polls, for the most part, he, every stop along the visit is, is designed, is very well choreographed to touch deeper chords in Israeli society, whether it's the visit to the Shrine of the Book, talking of the historical attachment of the land, or the stop at Herzl's tomb, or, uh, you know, talking to the Israeli uh, kids about the future in the 21st century. These are things that Obama will do very well at. And I, I, I think this trip is already, I'd be surprised if it isn't a success. There'll be some There'll be some hiccups. Why didn't he talk to the Knesset? Why weren't the students from REL invited with the other college students? There'll be some little hiccups, but the big piece, I think the public part, is, I think is going to be successful to the extent I can. And I think the way I see it is Obama doing this outreach. Some say, oh, he just wants to check a box. I think he sees that the way towards managing his relationship with the Israeli government runs through the Israeli public. It doesn't mean that uh, Netanyahu was completely full uh, poll focused on everything. Um, you know, he, he was on Gilad Shalit. He was on the uh, limited apology to Turkey. I think the issue of Iran is a gut, gut issue for Netanyahu, and it's not just the looking at public opinion, but certainly having public opinion more on his side, even if it's not a dramatic sea change, uh, could only help the president in, as he relates uh, to the new government. So I would say that's the first part. Uh, and there, I think Dennis and I agree. Um, I think the, the, the policy summit, and you know, these guys are going to be having probably something like four and a half, five hours together. Probably the most intense uh, conversation of time uh, that Netanyahu and Obama have ever spent together. Obama has said that there's no leader he sat with more than Netanyahu. Uh, but I think this is the most intense period of time that they've sat. 
Each one has got, I think, there's some sober expectations. They've been at this for four years already. Um, Obama knows that uh, Netanyahu maybe doesn't have Yitzhak Rabin's political vision. And uh, Netanyahu knows that Obama isn't an interventionist like John McCain. So each one comes to the meeting, you know, with more sober expectations. And that, uh, that could be a good thing, I think. But I would say that um, from, from the Israel uh, side, my sense is that, and here I just thought I would lay out how I saw that conversation and then lay out some of the other key points, Syria, Lebanon, uh, and of course the Palestinian issue. On the, on the Iran issue, I, I, you know, I think it's clear that the Netanyahu people go in believing what does Khamenei take away when they hear that certain weaponry due to sequester has been moved off the Gulf or that diplomacy has been, in their view, indecisive. Uh, how do they relate to that? Um, and so, and then there's the red line that Dennis mentioned in the IAEA report, you know, that the Israelis said, look, there was 180 kilograms of 20% uranium, now they're down to 168. Um, so he'll say, Netanyahu will say, I've been vindicated, red lines work. I told you so, Mr. President. And, uh, and Netanyahu will say, Obama will say, well, maybe that means we have more time. If Iran is diverting, that means we're not on the brink. <laughs> But Netanyahu will probably come back at him and say, look, with these P2 centrifuges, as, as Dennis pointed out, they can easily surge forward to the 230 to 250 kilograms they need for 90 percent uranium, you know, within a 30, 40 day uh, dash. So I think that, that ironically, they'll probably spar politely. No one's looking for confrontation. Uh, but they can ask pointed questions, even a very cordial atmosphere, uh, about that. Um, that each one will look at that IAEA report and read into it what they want to write, write, read into it. Oh, Netanyahu, red lines work. Obama, maybe we have more time. I think the second issue is, is the concern Israel has over the Kazakhstan uh, diplomacy, uh, the P5 plus 1. I'm saying the last round was in Kazakhstan. And here, I think that there's the fear that the United States is heading to a deal that Israelis may consider a bad deal. Now, you could say, well, the Israelis will have no choice but to take it. Uh, this is the best deal they're going to get. And that is a 20 percent deal on uranium. And after all, you know, Mr. Prime Minister, didn't you literally draw that red line at the UN at 20 percent? He'll say, well, yeah, I drew that, but that was for no, uh, as a causes belli. I didn't mean to say anything under 20 percent was kosher. Um, and and the, Netanyahu's fear is you've got Iran on the ropes, you've got them in the corner. This is unprecedented. The amount of international sanctions have been put together. Thank the United States. Thank the Europeans. Thank Israel that has kind of rung the bell on this. Um, and whatever you don't do now, you won't do. There's nothing more permanent in the Middle East than that which is temporary. If you let them off the hook now with the 20 percent, they'll be left with 5.9 tons of uranium. Enrich uranium, maybe at four, you know, four, four bombs worth, but that four bombs worth again could surge forward uh, if the inspectors aren't there and uh, they decide they want to go forward with new centrifuges. So I think there, there's a key difference there, and I don't see this being bridged uh, at this time. Now, another factor on Iran, which maybe we could talk more about in the Q and A, will be interesting. The new defense minister in Israel, Bogi Alon, who is not viewed to be as hawkish on the issue. But I think it should not be misconstrued. I think he also, there's no, I cannot find one member of the security establishment who's for containment. I haven't, I've been looking <laughs> for years now, and I can't find them. Uh, right now, their view is just that, you know, if America's leading, hold back. But if America doesn't lead, the same people who've been urging caution, including Yalon, will be the same people urging Israel forward. Um, so I think Yalon, on a certain level, the tone will be very different than Barack. But it won't, the message won't be fundamentally different. Between bomb and bombing, he will be on the bombing side if he feels that the U.S. and diplomacy uh, do not come forward. Now, what about the other issues? And here I think another issue that could, could come up in the meeting is the issue of Syria. Um, I mean, it definitely will come up. But in an operational sense, I think that there's a debate brewing in, in the Israeli policy circles about how active should Israel be in going after Hezbollah convoys, uh, taking out strategic weaponry? <laughs> Israel is not as, I think there's more, it, I find that there's no one in Israel that I met thinks the United States could be, now maybe you could say this is a big mistake, and maybe say I'm not talking to the right people, 
But of all the people I talked to, I didn't meet anyone who thought the U.S. would be decisive in, in Syria. They've kind of, I don't say written off the United States, but they just see it as such a mess that they don't see how it's going to be reversed. But at the same time, they are concerned of Hezbollah end of season sale, taking whatever weapons that they can, either into Lebanon or maybe even keeping it in a part of Syria that they deem friendly as a kind of a depot of their own. And here, I think there are a lot of Israelis who want to start being more proactive in firing on Hezbollah convoys there. They hit, as you know, that SA-17, uh, that convoy. The, the Israelis are stunned that the, the, the Russians have given this thing called the Yachunt, this anti-ship missile, uh, which could hit things in, in, in the Israeli port before they even leave Israel's port. Um, very advanced missiles. And they're wondering where Hezbollah is going to go next. So for them, it's defensive. It's not reshaping Syria. They think that's way above their pay grade. They think it's above the American pay grade. But at the same time, I think they feel that there might be certain defensive measures. When you ask them about uh, Jihad al-Nusra and things like that, they also, I, I don't feel that they, they're certainly not out to do any sort of border zone or anything like that, like they did in Lebanon. So um, I, I think that the, the discussion on Syria, some believe the country is disintegrating. Some believe the regime is just unraveling. I didn't see a policy consensus there yet either. So I don't know if it's going to be a sweeping discussion about Syria as it is going to be more limited. On Egypt, I also felt more optimism than I felt in previous trips. Previous trips, they were worried that Egypt was about to cancel the peace treaty. Now they think there's such chronic instability uh, that they think that they've got a lot of other things cooking, and this is not what they're going to be looking for. Some will point to Egyptian uh, uh, progress in going after rockets, the Fajrs, after November. Some will point to the flooding of certain Hamas tunnels. Uh, but others will say, hey, and even the Palestinian security people will confirm to you, they didn't flood the tunnels that Hamas views as strategic uh, from northern Sinai. But still, I found more optimism than I would have thought there. On the Palestinian issue, on the other hand, and this is my final uh, point, um, here I find it a, a, a mess, uh, no surprise. Uh, but also going to Ramallah, uh, maybe I'll start with Ramallah. And, and talking to officials there and people close to the president, I felt that there's a bit, um, I'll, use the, I'll say they're brimming with confidence, you could say overconfidence, that they have Israel in the corner, that they believe Israel is isolated in the world, that they, you know, they read everything in the press that's been written, and they feel that that November trip uh, at the UN was so successful that they're willing to go to the ICC, the International Criminal Court. When you say that that means that Israel will build an E1, this kind of bottleneck area east of Jerusalem, linking north and south, they say, fine. Uh, now, you'd say it's bravado, but the more and more Palestinians you talk to who believe it's either final status or bust, and bust for them means the UN, and not interested in any sort of coordinated unilateralism, you say the word interim agreement as if you want to rape someone's sister, um, it's a dirty word there, um, you're really seeing a, a confidence. I personally hope the president, in his stay over there, is able to talk to President Abbas, like Dennis said, and speak to them about the limitations of that strategy. I mean, two could go to the ICC. And the Israelis will, I hear, keep saying they're going to go to the ICC against the PA, and they'll tie them up for years in legal proceedings. I don't know. I don't see how any of this brings peace, by the way. But I, I'm concerned about it. I'm also concerned about decision-making um, as well. That on the, um, on the, um, that I'm also, well, before I say how the Israelis see it, I'm concerned about the isolation of Prime Minister Fayyad when the Palestinian official media doesn't even report on his activities anymore in the Palestinian press. I'm concerned that, uh, on one hand, the good news is the money, more money has arrived lately. He would say, oh, that's because Obama's coming, so of course the money's going to come. But that about $600 million has just arrived in the last uh, few months. That um, now their Palestinians will be paying full salaries this month for the first time in several months. So there's been some movement. There's been no change on the Fatah Hamas reconciliation. The PA people still tell me they think that Hamas's uh, focus is PLO, PLO, PLO. And we want a technocratic government and we want elections and they're not interested. And maybe it's because they're being supported by Qatar. 
Um, but so long as they focus on the PLO, the, the, the reconciliation is going nowhere. On the Israeli side, I'm concerned about the decision-making loop. You're losing a few people who were known for restraint on this issue, uh, Defense Administrator Barack, uh, Dan, Dan Meridor, two of them who were part of the what they call the Octet, the Prime Minister's inner consulting group. And they're gone. And now you have Yalon, who is um, more dovish as he may be on Iran, at least tactically dovish. He's more hawkish on the Palestinian issue, although he's not ideological. And I think if you could convince Yalon that there's going to be some Palestinian reciprocity and that they start saying things like two states for two peoples, you will see the Yalon and his team will also adjust. But without reciprocity, they're not going to. So I think, and also you have Uri Ariel, a settler, now the head of the housing ministry, uh, used to have an ultra-Orthodox person, uh, where the ultra-Orthodox issue was the main issue, now it's a settler issue. The head of the finance committee of the Knesset, also a settler, Nisan Smolyansky. I think that it's a different constellation there uh, that can make this more of an issue. I've raised this idea of no, a freeze beyond the barrier, and I find that there are people who are interested. Some say, but where's the reciprocity? But on the Palestinian side, we're not going to justify the barrier. We see the barrier as, you know how they call it, apartheid wall. So why would we legitimize that? But it could be that apart from the Palestinian issue, this is a way for Israel, these regardless of the Palestinians, vis-a-vis -vis signaling to Europe, the United States, maybe even to its own housing minister, that it wants to deepen its connection to the blocks, and it does that by drawing a distinction between blocks and non-blocks, which is 5% of the land, as many of you have heard me say before, where 80% of the settlers live. So, bottom line, I think this is, um, you know, this is, there are some differences here. I will end with maybe some good news that I, I found that they have uh, been hopeful that they think someone like Nasrallah uh, certainly is having some strategic distress over uh, you know the you know the decaying of, of the Assad regime. More relaxed about that, just as more relaxed about Egypt. And in Syria, I found a much more limited sort of agenda than I would have thought going in. Much instead of believing the U.S. will somehow reorder the Middle East to Israel's liking, I find that the Israel is, this is a sober kind of summit which, of what is doable and what is not doable. There's a lot of stuff about the new Israeli government, which I'm happy to discuss in the, in the Q and A. But I think this gives you a bit of a sense of how I see things. Thank you all very much. Thanks a lot, Rob. It's uh, good to be doing this, and it's. Uh it's good to be on this panel with my colleagues. You know, one of the great strengths about the Washington Institute and one of the things which makes it so nice to work here is to have colleagues like David and Dennis uh, and Ambassador Jeffrey uh, who are here and uh, are a great source of wisdom on this topic. Uh, I should also start by apologizing to our, our viewers who have HD screens who had to watch me eat lunch uh, at the beginning. And, uh, you know, it's one of the, the downsides of technology. One of the upsides, though, is I tell Rob we should be beginning all these things now by saying, you know, welcome, Mr. Secretary, uh, members of Congress, uh, members of the Diplomatic Corps, because, of course, no one watching on TV knows any different. Um, <laughs> that's the benefit of live streaming. So um, I think that uh, Rob asked me to do this in part because uh, the last presidential trip to the Middle East, uh, rather to Israel, uh, this part of the Middle East, was not by President Obama, but by President Bush, uh, and I worked for him at the time. Um, there was a presidential trip in May of 2008, uh, which uh, was to just Israel, Saudi Arabia, and Sharm el-Sheikh for the 60th anniversary of Israel's founding, the 75th anniversary of U.S.-Saudi relations, uh, and the World Economic Forum Conference in Sharm el-Sheikh, where uh, the President met with King Abdullah of Jordan, uh, President Abbas, uh, and some others as well. Um, and then there was a much longer trip in January of 2008 when the President went to Israel, the West Bank, Kuwait, Bahrain, United Arab Emirates, and Saudi Arabia and Egypt as well. A very long trip, which I can tell you, uh, you have to bear in mind that every single stop and every single stop in each country involves a briefing memo uh, if you're an NSC staffer. So when we talk about you know, places President Obama is and isn't visiting, remember there's a personal interest here for the NSC staff as well. Fewer, the fewer stops you make, the fewer memos you have to write, uh, which, is, uh, which is no small thing. Um, but it's, it's very interesting, as I was thinking about this, to compare the Middle East and, and our role in it then and now. Uh, and if you just go down some of these major issues which my colleagues have been talking about, uh, it's quite stark. Obviously, the clearest difference is Iraq. Uh, which, which I won't dwell on. Obviously, Iraq uh, in January 2008 was one of the main themes of the trip. That's why you go to a place like Kuwait. 
uh, at that time, for example, to visit Camp Arafjan. Um, obviously, that's different now since the U.S. withdrawal from Iraq. But looking at the other issues, the Israeli-Palestinian issue, January of 2008 was shortly after the Annapolis Conference, uh, just north of us in Annapolis, Maryland. Um, and at that time, there was uh, a combination of sort of uh, um, promise or optimism and alarm about the peace process. Uh, promise and optimism because of the Annapolis Conference and because of the negotiating process, uh, which we were hoping to kick off at the time. Uh, of course, we'd also had a, uh, right after the Annapolis Conference, a big dispute over some uh, construction uh, around Jerusalem, uh, which, uh, you know, obviously some things just don't change. Uh, but we managed to get over that uh, after the President's trip and actually have a negotiating process. So by May 2008, the negotiations were sort of deep underway. Now, obviously, the negotiations have been frozen for a matter of years. Um, and uh, Hamas, for example, is even more entrenched in Gaza than ever before. And obviously, we're facing a very different climate, a very different situation when it comes to this issue. Uh, if you look at the Levant, obviously, the Levant is quite different as well. We had, uh, in May 2008, you had Hezbollah essentially waging war against the Lebanese government. Uh, and that was an issue which came up again and again during that visit. Uh, and you also had, at the same time, the U.S. bringing very significant pressure to bear on Syrian President Assad, uh, in part because of his facilitation of al-Qaeda activities in Iraq. Well, some things have changed and some haven't. Obviously, Hezbollah is, is now very entrenched in the Lebanese government, uh, and that hasn't changed so much as our focus on it has dim diminished, I think. You know, we're just focused on other things. Lebanon is, in a way, uh, has been since 2009 sort of subordinated to the Syria issue. Uh, on Syria, we've actually come full circle, in a sense, going from engagement with Bashar al-Assad to now, again, pressure. Uh, perhaps even greater pressure uh, on Assad than we had in, uh, in 2008. Uh, and Assad himself is probably regretting that support for al-Qaeda in Iraq, uh, which is now coming back to, uh, to bite him in the form of Jabhat al-Nusra. Um, when it comes to Iran, you know, I was reading an article recently in preparation for a different speech uh, about the Iran negotiations. And it was uh, the president saying how the last offer we had made was meeting with a relatively positive response from the Iranians, uh, we, were, we were feeling optimistic, but we had to give them some time and space uh, while keeping all of our options on the table. The problem is that article was from 2006, uh, which tells you a little bit about how this issue has or hasn't changed. The fact is that this is the issue which feels the most similar now to, uh, to where it stood in 2008. Obviously, there's more sanctions, but Iran's nuclear program has expanded as well. And so this sort of status quo uh, may be deteriorating, but frankly, uh, looks pretty similar. <clears throat> And elsewhere, obviously, we've had these Arab uprisings. Uh, but even in 2008, our concerns about President Mubarak and his ability to continue ruling Egypt, uh, his sort of uh, his grasp of the situation in Egypt uh, was high. That concern was high. And at the time, we were trying to push for the development of political alternatives, I think, because of what you see playing out now. Um, and also, I would say for the Gulf states, obviously, there were quite a few visits to the Gulf states in those visits, in the, those trips. Uh, and that was a different relationship than the one we have now. It was a very close relationship with the Gulf states, uh, whereas now we find ourselves, I think, uh, at a distance from the Gulf states over issues like the Arab uprisings, like Iran, like Syria, for example. The clearest difference, though, I would say, is not on any one of these individual issues as much as it is on the U.S. role in the Middle East, uh, taken broadly. You know, in 2008, one of the things that's most striking, if you go back and you read those transcripts from the time, it's striking how down in the weeds we were on all these issues, whether it's the peace process, whether it's Syria, Lebanon, and so forth. The, the questions reporters were asking uh, were questions in minute detail about each aspect of these issues. Uh, and if you look now at the types of questions that get asked, the types of answers that are given, uh, we're just engaged at a very different level in the Middle East, at a very different level of detail uh, in issues like the peace process, like Lebanon, even like Syria and Iran, frankly. And I think that the perception in the region uh, and I encountered this on a, a recent trip, which I'll mention in just a moment, is not only are we out of the weeds, in a sense, but that we are sort of stepping back more broadly from this region. I, when, you, when you go to the region, what you hear from people, the, the, rather the examples they cite, are the U.S. withdrawal from Iraq and Afghanistan, uh, the withdrawal of that aircraft carrier, which, uh, which David mentioned, uh, from the Gulf, uh, our passivity in the face of the conflict in Syria, and our refusal to get further involved in that. Uh, our seeming indifference to, for example, the liberal opposition in a place like Egypt or a place like Iran, uh, like Bahrain, for example. Uh, our talk of a pivot to Asia, um, which is certainly noted in the Middle East uh, and is a topic of discussion there. 
uh, as well as our sort of political dysfunction and budgetary issues here in, in the United States. And so it, the ironic part of this is that, you know, President Obama came into office in 2008 talking about engagement, but I think that the legacy is quickly becoming one of disengagement from this region, of stepping back. Um, and as I mentioned, I was just on a trip that took me not only to the Gulf, not only to this region, uh, but, be, but farther afield. And the striking thing was that for all the differences that, for example, our GCC allies have on issues like Syria or political Islam or Iran, the one talking point they shared in common, even the Bahraini opposition, for example, uh, even when I was in South Asia, what I heard uh, from all of them was they're looking for clear articulations of U.S. policies, and they're looking for a stronger role, a more active role for the United States. Uh, I think that we often feel here in the United States like we're not wanted in this region. Uh, and maybe that's true to an extent in some quarters. I think we feel sometimes, uh, and I think uh, Dennis alluded to this when he was talking about the way that the administration began in the Middle East, <laughs> that because of mistakes uh, or missteps in places like Iraq, uh, that people would like to see us go. Uh, I think that, in fact, in the region, the, uh, the opinion is quite the opposite, that because of errors we made there, they view us as having even more responsibility uh, for securing this region, um, which is obviously uh, a, a gap between how we sometimes perceive it here. But that perception, look, whether right or wrong, uh, and whatever its cause, uh, and I agree with Dennis that there are a lot of unknowns in the region right now, which makes it difficult to come up with a sort of coherent strategy or get involved uh, down in the weeds. Um, that perception is undermining our policy in the region, I think. Uh, our allies, for example, are hedging their bets uh, because they're not sure if they can, in the, at the end of the day, count on us. Uh, I think this is clearest with Israel, and I agree with my colleagues that, you know, Part of this uh, visit to Israel for President Obama will be trying to inspire confidence uh, in our ally there. But I think it's true more broadly as well. Uh, you see, for example, the Gulf states, I think, acting more autonomously. And this idea of a sort of hub-and-spoke model in the Middle East, which I've talked about before, where the U.S. has its center uh, and our allies kind of on the spokes, uh, has really changed. And I think it's not clear at this point what the new order or what the new structure will be and what role we'll have in it, whether it's at the center or at the periphery. Um, the transitional countries, Egypt, uh, Tunisia, and places like this, Libya, I think are, are not convinced of the value proposition of alliance with the United States. Uh, and that's a problem for us going forward. And then, of course, uh, our adversaries, Iran and uh, groups affiliated with Iran, for example, uh, have this perception, which I think is wrong, uh, uh, of the United States as being in some sort of irreversible decline. Uh, that if they simply wait, if they simply hang back, uh, that will eventually disengage and they don't need to worry about, uh, about what we might do. I think that this visit to the Middle East needs to be a fresh start for President Obama, uh, a renewed commitment to the region. And I think it has to start with worrying less about public opinion. Uh, and here maybe I diverge from, uh, from my colleagues in saying that I think that the, it would be a mistake to look at this visit in terms of the public uh, aspect of it, the public diplomacy. I think that we've worried in a sense too much about public opinion uh, in the region, and in fact have made very little impact on public opinion in the region, and not enough about the interests of our allies. At, at the end of the day, alliances are about shared interests, and I think that we need to go and talk to these governments uh, about those shared interests and convince them that we're going to act to advance those shared interests. Um, and I think if we do that, and if actions follow that, that the publics will come around as well, frankly, especially in democracies. Uh, and when it comes to democracy, look, I, I think that the Arab uprisings have proven very challenging to this idea of supporting democracy. I, I think what we need to realize is that, for example, in a place like Egypt, supporting democracy means more than simply backing the victors of elections. Um, because, frankly, those victors, those groups may themselves act undemocratically. I think we're seeing some of that in Egypt now. I think it means supporting the institutions of democracy, the rule of law, constitutions, political parties, and, of course, repeated elections, um, not just one election. And I think we need to focus more on that and more on building this kind of fabric of democracy in the region uh, and less on feeling as though we need to endorse whoever wins an election. Uh, and then finally, look, I think we need to be prepared to be judged on our actions and not just on our words. Uh, so just going and giving another high-profile speech is not going to cut it. People want to see action, especially because there's a view that the 2009 speech, frankly, wasn't really carried out, didn't really translate into policy. Uh, and I think the places where we'll be most judged on our actions will be Syria and Iran. Uh, and I think in Syria, look, we need to stake out a strategy. We need to put resources behind it. We need to build a coalition around it. I think it's very damaging, this idea that the United States is passive or unable to accomplish its objectives with respect to Syria, when people see Syria as, in a sense, the most urgent, most immediate national security priority for the United States and our allies. 
When it comes to Iran, I think we need to reconcile the conflicting messages that we uh, often send on Iran. Uh, we say the military's option on the ta the military option is on the table. We won't hesitate to use force, but we take an aircraft carrier out of the Gulf. Um, we talk about preventing Iran from getting a nuclear weapons capability, but then we seem prepared to make concessions in the negotiations, uh, which are difficult to understand against uh, against those statements. Um, and I think what we need to do is first clarify the objective. Uh, and I think uh, Dennis mentioned this, and I agree. What does it mean? What does prevention mean? Uh, how do we think of this idea of a nuclear weapons capability? And is it the same as, the, as our allies, especially Israel? Uh, you saw a little bit of uh, dissonance over this in the president's remarks about Iran being a year or more away from a nuclear weapon, uh, and the DNI's remarks about, well, they haven't even decided uh, whether or not they're going to make a nuclear weapon yet. I think, in fact, underlying that is, uh, is a common view between the President and DNI, or at least I hope so. That's the way it's supposed to work. Um, but I think we have a hard time articulating that view, and we have a hard time explaining how that might be the same or different from, for example, the way Israel sees it. I think if you can clarify that objective, um, that perhaps this is about preventing an undetectable breakout, for example, uh, then you can start to explain your negotiating behavior, the concessions you're willing to make, uh, in terms of that objective. Uh, and persuade your allies that, in fact, your your stance in Almaty, your stance in these negotiations, uh, furthers rather than undermines that objective that you share with them. These are just two examples, um, but I think they're the most important. Uh, I think the most in important message, though, uh, that needs to come out of this trip is that we're getting back in the game on all these issues, that we're getting back down into the weeds, as it were. Thanks very much. Great. Very good. Uh, three uh, very insightful presentations about different aspects of this trip. Um, uh, lots of different angles at which uh, we can address uh, this topic. I was... Uh um, uh, I was um, uh, remarked to myself about David's use of the term sober, and he uh, he um, he actually found good news in the fact that Egypt is on co near collapse, <laughs> and that uh, uh, that because of this near collapse, the Egyptians are so focused internally they don't have time to, I guess, make mischief on their borders. I assume that's how the Israelis are viewing it. Um, uh, just two other like little pieces of sobriety that I would just wanted to put on the table quickly. Um, I do think there's something to the fact that both um, uh, President Obama and uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu uh, got themselves reelected. Um, in the world of political leaders, there's um, there's a special place for leaders who manage to get reelection. It's it's no small achievement, and I think the level of mutual respect, grudging perhaps, but the level of mutual respect goes up, and. And it it's, it's only operates in that rarefied world of people who know what is involved in the entire process of figuring out and working and getting oneself reelected. They will be with each other for a period of time. They're not going to be trying to undermine each other, although this Israeli government is, is uh, perhaps less solid than the previous Israeli government. Maybe David wants to comment on it. But I do think there's something, uh, there's something that contributes to the solidity of the relationship um, when the two leaders look at each other as re-elected by, uh, by their own politics. And the other point I wanted to make is, um, ironically, both, both men come to this summit with a, uh, a much heavier emphasis on the need to address internal politics in their own countries um, uh, uh, as opposed to the normal issues on their bilateral agenda. I mean, uh, uh, it's a very quick trip for the president. He's coming back to deal with the end of government, um, which uh, is supposed to happen in a few days. And, and Prime Minister Netanyahu's new government is, is at least as much about domestic issues as it is everything we've just spoken about. Um, so I just wanted to put those those items on the table. There's lots more to talk about in terms of Jordan and, and perhaps the very important message the president is sending by going. Uh, this is his first trip to an Arab country, I believe, since the, um, the, the series of Arab uprisings, and he's picking a monarchy um, that hasn't witnessed the same sorts of tumultuous change. And what message this sends elsewhere in the region, I think, is very powerful. In any case, uh, let me turn now to, to your questions and uh, your comments. Yeah, from this of the Jerusalem report. Uh, there have been reports the last few months, maybe speculation, uh, that since the United States, the President Obama, will be less active in Palestinian Israeli issues, peacemaking, uh, that he uh, may leave that to others, especially the Europeans, which could mean 
not objecting to what the Europeans are, are doing or encouraging in being in the UN or measures like have been late, lately taken that uh, uh, European countries are labeling products from the West Bank as not coming from Israel, things like that. Any thoughts on that? I doubt that. Uh, first, the uh, as I said before, he chose to to take this trip, and the trip itself sends a signal that he retains an interest in this, number one. Number two, uh, it's never going to be in the U.S. interest to see bad ideas adopted. Uh, we're going to end up having to pick up the pieces anyway. So th those who think that, well, he's washing his hands of it, if he was washing his hands of it, he wouldn't be taking the trip there, number one. Uh, number two, um, he, his Secretary of State has made it very clear this is an issue of great interest to him, uh, and I think uh, part of this trip is designed to not only send the president's interest in it, but to create, uh, in a sense, win behind the back uh, of the Secretary of State. Uh, and number three, as I said, if you if you adopt ideas that are in the end going to be destructive to trying to get anything done, the United States is going to have a posture on that, and the United States won't remain indifferent to it. Um, I want to say something about this to echo what, what Dennis said. I, I think that, um, you know, it's important, we use this term honest broker. Uh, and it's important to keep in mind what this means. You know, the term, the term originates with Bismarck uh, and the Dry Kaiserbund, and I, that's all I'll say about the Dry Kaiserbund. But um, the idea of it was not somehow that you have a neutral mediator, because let's face it, there's lots of neutral mediators in the world. The idea of it was that you're close to both sides. In fact, one of the closest uh, to both sides. And the fact is that only the United States can play that role. Uh, and I think there was actually misunderstanding about that early on in this administration. Uh, that somehow we needed to distance ourselves from one side or the other instead of actually being quite close to the other. And I think that one thing we'll hopefully detect or see out of this trip is whether that view has changed, uh, whether there's an understanding that, look, the first thing we need to do is establish the confidence and trust of both sides, not one or the other, uh, if we're going to play a useful role here. It also means, though, that, frankly, there is no one else that can play this role. And the danger is not so much that someone, someone else will come along uh, and uh, become the honest broker, uh, but that uh, less, but that more destructive forces uh, will come into play, whether it's Hamas, uh, whether it's Iran, for example, uh, that will take advantage of the stagnancy in the issue to create trouble. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Erikat, on my left. Thank you, Rob. Uh, my name is Saeed Erikat from al Quds Daily Newspaper. My question is to both Ambassador Dennis Strauss and David Makovsky. Uh, in this room a few weeks back, Senator Rubio advised the President not to do anything, not to change anything, not to launch any new initiatives. But since then, we've heard that the President might actually suggest to the Israelis or demand a timetable for ending the occupation and for a Palestinian state uh, to emerge. I want to know that where do you fall? Is that a good idea at this time, especially in view of the new Israeli government, and would it be responsive to that? Thank you. But the Israelis are very relaxed in terms of believing that Obama is going to come with some you know, policy initiative, ultimatum, or something of any sort. And what Jay Carney said on the record, that he wasn't going to come with that, they all believe him, actually. And um, I think the question is more of how does two new governments work together? You you know, as Dennis pointed out, you have Secretary Kerry, who, who wants to prioritize this among maybe a half a dozen issues. And you have a new Israeli government, but that cannot help but deal with this issue. I don't think this president wants on his watch in the next four years that the two-state solution expires. And I think that's a strong statement, but I think that's really true when you think of the pace of settlement activity. That's not a, a big concern. So even if you can't do a grand deal, if you can ensure that you preserve the option for a two-state solution, I think that's very important. So even though I don't think there's any drama, immediate drama, or any confrontation between these two leaders now, I think it would be a mistake because everyone in Washington has forgotten about the Palestinian issue, and maybe people in the Middle East have got much bigger issues on their own agendas, that somehow this issue is somehow going to just fade out. Uh, I fear that will just be there'll be there'll be an upsurge in either in violence or a, a different sort of a third intifada where you'll be digging uh, fresh graves. You'll be left with old problems, and each side knows that this issue is not going away. So I don't. I think it would be a mistake to put the focus on some sort of immediate confrontation. I don't see that, but I do see that these two have 
but work with the Palestinians to find a way out. And, and that's why I, uh, Said, I, I made my point about the UN, because I think it's, it might be seductive for the Palestinians, but I don't think that's going to give the two-state solution either. So, you know, each side here has got to find a way how they're going to go forward. Um, what the, what the policy options are, I'd be happy to discuss it, but uh, I, I don't see this issue, you know, f fading out, nor do I see it uh, imminent collision. D Dennis, let me, let me ask this question slightly differently. Um, uh, the administration has... Uh, um, the administration has done a, uh, a gallant effort of lowering expectations and actually terming this a listening tour, almost as though this is a new president who hasn't been in office already for four plus years. Um, and we shouldn't forget the president actually has a Middle East peace plan on the table, uh, May 2011, um, about which we hear very little, I think almost nothing in the, in the press briefings about this. Can the administration um, uh, 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 sort of shelve that, put that in the drawer and start afresh? Um, uh, and do people, are the people in the region going to let him shelve it and start afresh? You know, I think that both the key to what you're asking and what Saeed was asking uh, is very similar. The question is, what's to be done? You know, the what, what shouldn't be done is to launch something that you know is going to fail. Uh, because what we have right now uh, since this is sort of a siren song combined, is a profound sense of disbelief on both sides. So if you do something that's guaranteed to fail, all you're going to do is make the sense of failure a self-fulfilling prophecy. Uh, and this gets to really what David was saying. There is, There may not be a shelf life on the issue of ideas that the President raised, because I think the May 2011 speeches, and there were two within three days of each other, uh, they they reflect basic assumptions about what it takes in terms of goals uh, for an agreement and also parameters for trying to reach such an agreement. The question isn't whether those ideas are ideas that somehow don't exist anymore. I think they exist. The question is, what do you do now to deal with what is a stalemate? And the longer the stalemate goes on, the deeper the disbelief and the greater the risk that the very idea of two states is lost. Uh, and if the very idea of two states is lost, then both sides will lose because eventually they'll have to come back to it. Uh, but you'll go through some process that is highly destructive where the pain is, is quite intense on both sides. I think one of the reasons it doesn't make sense to say there's nothing to be done is because then you're going to end up dealing with the consequences of that. Uh, and, and it seems to me what this trip is about is not so much the idea that the president will forget ideas that he presented, but this trip is about <coughs> talking with the leaders on each side without having expectations. The problem when you go and expectations are high is the kind of private conversations you have are completely different. Each side uh, in a situation like that, having been there before, each leader in a situation like that then feels the need to sort of get into much more of a defensive crouch. Uh, and they're worried about, all right, what is it that I have, to, what is it expected of me? You know, I'll never forget uh, a trip I took to, uh, to see Rabin, right after President Clinton had seen President Assad in Geneva uh, in January 1994. And prior to the trip, uh, we had, you know, the, the Prime Minister uh, conveyed to us what it is he wanted to see come out of it. And we actually produced what it is he wanted to see come out of it. So I walked into the meeting uh, with Rabin feeling highly confident that, you know, all right, uh, we did what you asked. Uh, and the first thing he did was immediately devalue what I came with. Now, why did he do it? Because he knew I was coming to ask something of him. Uh, and if you go into these kinds of meetings and the expectations are very high, then each leader is suddenly worried about what you're going to ask of them. When the expectations are low, then you're in a much better position to actually have a serious conversation. And you can actually explore, all right, what are the possibilities here? But maybe the way you, you frame that conversation is by talking about what are the consequences of not getting anything done with each side? Uh, and if the consequences are severe enough, how can we think together about what it is that could be possible? And where could there be some, some points of commonality that we could then build on? I expect that, you know, you're going to have, they'll end up being you know, serious conversations in private that are much more likely to be held precisely because no one is anticipating that he's coming in there and laying a plan on the table.
uh, Jonathan Reinhold, uh, George Washington University and Barilan University. Um, what are the what are the consequences inside Israel, um, following on from what Dennis just said, of the feeling of being relaxed that the president's not going to have a plan? Because certainly when Obama won the election, there was very much being well, we're going to have to come up with something because he is going to come for something. And in that context, um, you mentioned that the Palestinians have no respect for an interim agreement. Um, but if something like that was put forward and involved movement on settlements, uh, wouldn't, it, wouldn't it just inevitably move forward because you can't really say no to something like that? I thought the one new idea I heard on the Palestinian side was this idea of a mutual freeze that they called it, which is, let's take time out, six months, we don't do anything at the ICC, the UN, any UN agency, and let's just talk to Bibi. But to do that, we want the Israelis to fully free settlements everywhere. And so the Israelis like the first part. Uh, they don't like the second part. Um, and they consider that a non-starter. Um, and the Palestinians will consider a non-starter of any freeze beyond the barrier. Um, so you get into a lot of these zero-sum issues that are, are very hard. The question is, to me, is, I mean, I kind of dangled this idea of yalon and reciprocity. Uh, that, w that, to me, is the one hook that I kind of saw some light which is if each side saw that the other side was doing something, then maybe they would do something. And, you know, the problem is I don't see them doing the full freeze. And Israel won't value the full freeze. The issue of East Jerusalem is going to come up. I mean, it's just... But I think it gets to, to Dennis's point on the disbelief. And both Ray Alomar and I also did an op-ed in the Washington Post on this, this issue. Uh, the need for synchronized political messaging to the publics. Because how could it be that each side with shrinking majority say, well, we're for a two-state solution, but the other side isn't, therefore it won't happen. So there's got to be something where these leaders have an interest because, as Dennis said, the question is, what if nothing is done? There's going to be a radicalization. So I, I do, I'm concerned about that. What that reciprocity will mean, I don't know yet. But I found when I tried out this idea of much more focus on public confidence building, you know, I got shot at by both sides because no one wants to take that sort of time and they don't want to um, engage in that in, in that way because they maybe because they feel it puts obligations on them to reciprocate. But, but I think that somehow reciprocity has got to be that one hook, that one light here where whatever that, what the, that quid pro quo is, that that somehow is that baseline for getting moving things upward, even if it isn't as sweeping as a freeze for freeze. Uh, David, while you're yeah. at the podium, can you take 30 seconds to give us uh, a little bit more um, in the weeds uh, assessment of who actually in the new Israeli government uh, uh, is, takes responsibility for these issues? Huh. What is the role between Tsipi Livni, the, the non-existent foreign minister, um, uh, the new minister of finance who has an interest in this, etc.? Huh. I mean, don't, don't, don't take us... Like right. deep underground, right. Right. but right. you know. Okay, on the sir, uh, a, a quick, uh, a very quick tour to his own. Look, um, you know, you were right, Rob, when we talked about how the, the domestic agenda is is pivotal for both governments. Maybe in a way that it hasn't been um, in the past, uh, certainly recently. That's true. I think the question for me is Netanyahu had that forum called the Octet, the Sheminia, where that was kind of his consultative forum. And he felt he had a partner there by the name of Ehud Barak, the defense minister. There's no Ehud Barak anymore. And he doesn't have the same relationship with the new defense minister, even though he's of his own party. He looks around the table and he sees four guys want to inherit him while he's still alive. And that is Yaron and uh, Lieberman, who is, has his legal issues but sees himself coming back to the foreign ministry. Lapid who has said he's going to run against him, and Bennett, the head of this new uh, party um, uh, on the right. So it's unclear to me that, that I think you have a knowledge deficit uh, that, you didn't ha that you didn't have the last time around. We had someone with Barack's experience, Meridor's experience, for that matter, Benny Begin's experience. All these three guys are gone. And the question is, does that mean the wheels, the brakes have come off the train, and that now it's more of a runaway car? Or you say, no, not at all. Lapid is there. 
living might be there, and there'll be people who might not have the same amount of years of experience, but are maybe counterpoints to uh, some of the other forces. So it, what, what's unclear to me yet is to what extent that forum that and Netanyahu relied upon, how central is that going to be? What is going to mean the loss of that uh, knowledge, uh, of that deficit of, of experience? But I do think for Lapid, who was the key factor, he definitely sees that it, his goal is that Israel just be a normal Western country, that the middle class has a, a better quality of life. It sounds very familiar to people here. But the, uh, he has said that the road to that is dealing with the Palestinian issue. Um, he says not dividing Jerusalem, but everything else, we've got to work this out. I don't know, though, you know, what that means. Uh, you have Bennett gave an interview or somewhere he was quoted in a, in a column of Nahum Barnea of Yediot Achronot when the reporter asked him about Iran. He goes, I have no clue. Now, this is a guy that's going to be on the inner sanctum of Israel. And he says, I have no clue. So I just wonder how this constellation is going to configure itself. And I would hope that a lot of time, if it's foreign diplomats, uh, you know, whether it's in Europe, whether, whether it's our country, the United States, that we spend a lot of time with these new people going to be sitting around the table. But I think the central factor, and I, I don't want to go too much in the weeds to keep to your idea, Rob, the central factor here is that these two guys, Bennett and Lapid, have been the central access of this government. And Netanyahu was convinced, utterly convinced, that these two neophytes, he could break that alliance the day after the election, and he'll do it through the front door, the side door, the back door, the chimney. He will do it, and he will get a government more to his liking where he could keep his ultra-Orthodox base. And what he found out is that these two guys who did not met once, only once before the election, but live actually right near each other in Israel, and except for the West Bank, which is not a small matter, they have almost identical views. And I would look at these two young guys and see, just as Netanyahu could not break that alliance in the, in the run-up to the coalition, and they, those two prevail, to what extent are they a force going forward? I don't know if they'll be a force on diplomacy or not, because here they actually differ. Victor Comras, uh, isn't there a critical message, public message, that has to be sent to Iran and to the Israeli about Iran and their nuclear program? And what is that critical message? Uh, to Dennis, please. Well, I, uh, I think the es essence of that message is that when the president says that prevention is the objective, he means it. Uh, look, the key to coercive diplomacy working is having no doubts about the readiness to fulfill the threats you make. Uh, Mike was saying there's been some mixed messaging, and I think he's right. The way to deal with that is to make sure there's one consistent message. Uh, I don't think it requires the president to say anything that he hasn't said. I think it's completely consistent. His message has been pretty much consistent, but I think it is important, uh, you know, that frankly when he talks about Iran, inevitably it's going to come up because the focus is going to be that way in Israel. But if he gets questions like, say, when he's in Jordan, I would hope he would say something about Iran there as well. So it becomes clear when he's talking about Iran, it's not only because he's in Israel. He has a message for Iran that is consistent wherever it is that he is. Uh, at the end of the day, the, the Iranians, um, you know, we, by their behavior, have signaled, you know, they tend to respect certain kinds of thresholds. Uh, and. I think the more they come, they become convinced that we are that we want diplomacy to succeed. And I think the, the core of the message ought to be, we very much want diplomacy to succeed. But at the end of the day, that'll be up to the Iranians. If they want the diplomacy to succeed, there's a good possibility it can. But when the president says, you know, the clock is ticking, that the window will close, uh, that has to be clear. That in fact. There's going to come a point where if we don't see a change in Iranian behavior, uh, we will act to fulfill the objective that the president has laid out. I just, I just want to build on what Dennis said, um, because I think I would go even a step further, which is I, I think that uh, first I want to reiterate what Dennis said, that this isn't really a U.S.-Israel issue. We, it tends to be portrayed that way uh, very often. And I think that's primarily because the U.S. and Israel are the two countries in the world which uh, could use uh, sort of independent force against Iran. 
Uh, but that said, I think that the Jordanians are just as concerned about it, as are all of our other allies uh, in this region. Uh, when I went, uh, as I said, to the Gulf, I heard about it from all of them. And so I think everyone in the region will be listening uh, for this message, and that includes the Iranians. Uh, and I think that the, the message to the Iranians, in addition to what Dennis said, I think has to be that the U.S. and Israel are together on this. Um, not just the U.S. Uh, has Israel's back, in a sense, but that we share some kind of conception of, of our objective. Because I, I, I think there's a danger that, look, the, Israel is a strategic asset to the United States. The United States is undoubtedly a strategic asset to Israel. And severing that alliance uh, would be a tremendous boon to a country like uh, Iran, to the Iranian regime, I should say. Uh, and we don't want the Iranian regime to feel that through their actions, by, say, getting in some space between Israeli and U.S. red lines, that they could somehow fracture that alliance uh, and achieve some kind of strategic objective, even at the expense, perhaps, of enduring uh, a military attack uh, from Israel or, or, or from, uh, from others. Uh, if they have that in their minds, then, of course, there's an incentive for them to push forward uh, beyond the Israeli red line, uh, which would be very dangerous, I think. So I think there has to be a, a very clear message, not just about prevention, but also about the solidarity between the U.S. and Israel on our objectives, on our red lines. Thank you. Uh, my name is Connor Goddard. I'm from the Project on Middle East Democracy. Uh, my question is to Ambassador Ross and Mr. Singh. Um, it was mentioned that uh, Obama's first trip to an Arab country will be to a monarchy uh, after the Arab up uprising. Um, what message does this send to the Jordanian people? How will it be perceived? Uh, many of whom are still asking for a new election law, uh, for increased pol political representation. Uh, and to Arabs around the, the region who live under monarchies, like in Bahrain, where the U.S. has been largely silent on numerous human rights abuses. Um, and secondly, more importantly, what should Obama say uh, while he's in Jordan to reassure the Arab people that the U.S. is still committed to the values of human rights and democracy? Thank you. You know, I think the best posture on this is also not unlike what I was saying about the Iranian issue. This is not a, an issue for one place that he goes to. We should have a set of common principles that we're talking about, repeating all the time when it comes to the area. You know, yes, he's going to a monarchy. Yes, we have a very strong strategic stake uh, in the well-being uh, of, uh, of Jordan and of, of, uh, of King Abdullah and his government. I think the president in public should emphasize, you know, our commitments to Jordan. He should emphasize as well our commitments to a set of principles and how we want to see them fulfilled everywhere. Uh, privately, I think with the king, uh, the, very much of the focus should be on how does how can we work with Jordan to improve their governance. I think there's few things that will have more of a positive effect over time than enhancing the effectiveness of Jordanian governance. And I think you know the the mix of public and private messages uh, is something that. Um, you know, should be a part of this trip overall. Let me say, I, I don't think the, I think in part the premise of the question is not really fair in the sense that I don't think it's right to say that the administration has been silent on human rights abuses anywhere in the region, uh, whether in Bahrain or elsewhere. Um, in fact, I think that uh, the policy today should be the policy uh, that we had in 2008, that we should be helping each one of these countries in its own way to find the, the right path towards political and economic reform. And that's a very difficult path. And I, and I think one thing the Arab uprisings demonstrates uh, demonstrate is that this is a difficult path to find a sort of political evolution that leaves everybody in the country better off, uh, that, that might be superior, frankly, to revolution. Um, and I think that when, uh, when he goes to Jordan, for example, the, the, the Jordanians have been a close ally, a good ally. Um, and I think there's an interest there uh, in the government, frankly, in reform. And so that will be part of the conversation. But I think our role there uh, is going to be su to support that process in a sense. Um, and I think, frankly, uh, I agree with Dennis that uh, this is both uh, – this is a strategic issue for the U.S. and Israel as well. Uh, and so this will undoubtedly come up in Israel, uh, and I think the president should be prepared to talk about it there, and I'm sure he will. Dan, you right back. And my question is addressed to Michael. Michael, you said that there is a strategic convergence between Israel and the United States on the need to prevent Iran from getting a nuclear weapons capability. Now, as far as I know until now, uh, is that Netanyahu indeed talked about preventing Iran from having a nuclear capability, but uh, the president has only talked about preventing Iran from getting a nuclear weapon. Is there anything new in the administration's position which suggests that now the administration also has officially come to the conclusion it needs to prevent a, a nuclear capability, not just a nuclear weapon? 
Well, you know, frankly, this might be a better question for Dennis. I, I, because I think, look, our, our message has been mixed on this front. I agree with you, Rafi, that uh, the president has, for example, in his last interview on this subject, he said weapon uh, as opposed to weapons capability. Uh, whereas capability clearly has been uh, both the Israeli focus, as we saw from Prime Minister Netanyahu's September speech, as well as the U.S. focus in the past. I, I think, though, frankly, the terminology the U.S. uses has varied, um, which again sends a mixed message. Um, the point, I think, here is that I, I do believe that underlying that, um, and I believe it's just based on uh, the kind of totality of the evidence, that in fact both the U.S. and Israel are focused on the same thing, which is preventing an undetectable breakout. Or at least, and that's certainly my hope, is that that's the, the focus. So you look at the question of, well, how quickly could Iran um, develop the weapons-grade uranium for a single or, you know, a, well, a single nuclear weapon? Um, and how can we be sure to, that we can prevent them from getting to that point? I would argue that the weaponization part of this is really, in a sense, and, and we've talked about this before, it really, in a sense, not relevant to this consideration. Because once they have the fuel, uh, then I think the concern is that the weaponization part of it uh, is harder to detect, uh, can take place uh, in other facilities in a shorter time frame. Um, I think, you know, that the underlying sort of policy objective there is the same. Uh, but we need to make sure that we speak clearly about that. And then we need to talk about what that means, as Dennis said before, and how that fits in with the strategy we have in the negotiations and in every other aspect of our Iran policy. Uh, so, uh, so look, I think this is an issue that, uh, as my colleague said, this has to be clarified between the two leaders uh, in, this, uh, in these discussions. Actually, uh, Rafi was asking my question I was going to ask. I think there's a fundamental difference in how they're looking at when the United States says it will prevent Iran from getting a nuclear weapon. I think they've hidden, the administration has hidden behind the concept of when they actually start building the weapon. And uh, I think this will be a major issue in the talks uh, between Netanyahu and the president. I, look, I think, that to get to, to Maury's point, look, I think Israel has a two-found fear, which is well, if they go above 20%, and that they, within 30, 40 days, can get weapons-grade fuel at 90 percent enrichment. Israel asked two questions. Will you know it in real time, and will you act on what you know? And that, I don't think they feel they've gotten satisfactory answers. I'm sure, again, I have no doubt that there's a strategic convergence between the United States and Israel. Nobody wants Iran to get a bomb. That's a given. The question is more on the policy level, which is, how will you know it in time, and how will you act on what you know in those 30 to 40 days? And that's why I think Israel's fear of, of drawing the line the way it did. But that's only part of the, the, P, the puzzle, because even if you say the goal of the P5 plus 1 talks is to make sure there is no 20 percent enrichment, Israel will say, but what about the four bombs, the 5.9 tons of lower enriched uh, uranium that with these new centrifuges, they can surge very quickly? And I just feel it always comes back to those same two questions. And it's under that broader rubric of how do you prevent. But, it, it, you know, you have to get into the weeds uh, on, those, on those two questions. And, and I, I just think there's been a deadlock. Dennis, uh, weapon or capability to make a weapon? Well, I think, you know, look, there's a reason that you have ambiguity here. And the reason you have ambiguity, first of all, because uh, to define capability is not a simple thing to do. Uh, according to some definitions, you could say they had it some time ago. Uh, so the, the issue is, what's the point, and this is really what Mike was raising, what's the point at which you lose confidence in your ability to prevent them from presenting the world with a fait accompli? Because they can move more quickly than you can discover it and respond. Now, the fact is what David is suggesting, there isn't a deadlock on this. That's just wrong. There have been very serious discussions between the two sides. Uh, and there are, there are differences in perspective. And the, per, the perspective, I would say, while there's a difference, I think the gap between the two has been narrowed. And I think what you'll find is but the, the two leaders, was one of the things I was saying, the two leaders, I think, will have an extensive discussion on the meaning of prevention. And that's the, that's the core of this issue. What's the point at which the objective of prevention would lose its meaning? because you can no longer ensure that you can achieve what you've said you would achieve. Hi, my name is Dana. Um, I'm a freelance journalist, so I work for whoever takes my story. Um, 
My, my question was it's actually a, it's for, a very successful news organization. <laughs> it is. It's the future of journalism. Um, my question was for Michael, and you spoke a little bit about the relationship with the GCC countries, and I was wondering if you could elaborate a little bit more on that, and if we could talk about if the changing energy environment globally, and especially in the United States, as the United States becomes more energy um, self-sufficient rather than independent, and how that impacts the relationship with the Middle East, specifically with the GCC. Countries. Look, we've, we've had some divergences between ourselves and the GCC countries. Some of it comes down to messaging, as we were saying before. I mean, they, I think the GCC countries and our allies across the region have the same sorts of reservations and worries about exactly what is the U.S. policy uh, on something like Iran as, for example, Israel does. Uh, they have the same uh, worries about will the U.S. actually back up those policies uh, as, as our other allies do. And that extends beyond the Middle East, frankly, uh, to allies further afield. Um, I, th I think that uh, the divergences have been over things like, for example, the ascendancy of, uh, of Islamist groups. Uh, the United States has been relatively sanguine about that, actually, whereas some of our allies are much more worried about it, worried about the intentions of groups like the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt, for example. Um, when it comes to Iran, I think there's a concern, uh, again, amongst our allies that we focus almost exclusively on the nuclear issue, uh, almost as though we're having an arms control negotiation with the Iranians, uh, whereas many of our allies see the Iranians in, uh, in a much kind of broader sense, causing trouble in the region. Uh, and again, I don't think it's that, uh, that the administration here doesn't see those things, uh, but it's a matter, again, of perception. Um, I don't think we're perceived as being sufficiently engaged on some of those issues. Um, and uh, when it comes to the energy relationship, look, I think this is in many ways overblown. I, I think that energy uh, independence in terms of supply uh, is a good thing for the United States in terms of our energy security uh, for, for many, many reasons. But that doesn't mean that we'll suddenly not care about, for example, energy prices. Energy prices uh, which will continue to be set in many ways in the Middle East. Uh, and, and affected by events in the Middle East uh, affect so many things uh, in the global economy and in the U.S. economy. Um, the security of our allies, uh, whether in the Middle East or, or further afield, you know, uh, frankly, on, on every continent, depend in many ways on, on energy prices, on food prices, which in turn depend on energy prices and so forth. So um, I, I think that our independence of supply, if and when it comes to pass, will be excellent, but it really won't diminish uh, the interest that we have in the Middle East. Uh, so I frankly don't uh, hear a lot of concern about that uh, when, I, when I go to the region. I, I hear much more about it here, frankly. Very good. Well, thank you, Dennis, David, and Mike. Thank you for your presentations. Thank you all for joining us today. And uh, please look out on your, um, on your emails for, again, the release of this um, strategic uh, transition paper, Obama II in the Middle East by Dennis and Jim Jeffrey, and for what I'm sure will be the, uh, the written analysis of the President's trip that my colleagues will be producing um, and will be transmitting to you uh, probably as he's flying home. So thank you. Thank you all very much for joining us today. Bye-bye.